This is podcast number 20 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to take a close look at the Dominion of New England. In 1686, the English king, James II, decided to pursue a new colonial policy that called for reorganizing the boundaries and governments of some of the English colonies in North America. This restructuring involved the merging of the New England colonies into one big super colony called the Dominion of New England. Two years later, New York and New Jersey were also added to the Dominion. The Dominion only lasted a few years, however, as political missteps by James and religious opposition forced him to flee England and to lose his throne. Without the king to support it, the Dominion quickly disintegrated. Many of the leaders that James had appointed to govern this colony were arrested by the colonists, and the colonies that had been merged into it resumed their former political structures. Despite having lasted only a few years, the Dominion of New England permanently impacted the New England region and is still affecting the United States today. Our story begins in the 1640s during the English Civil War. Parliament won that war against the king, set up a court, and tried the king for treason and then had him executed. Oliver Cromwell, one of the generals of the parliamentary army, was made Lord Protector of England, and for the next two decades England had no king. In 1660 that all changed with the restoration of the monarchy. One of the sons of the executed king, also named Charles, was crowned King of England as Charles II. Charles decided upon a vengeful policy of trying to punish the judges and others who had put his father to death. Some of the judges, interestingly, had fled to New England for security and safety. The independent and defiant attitude of the New England colonies, especially Massachusetts Bay, had been an irritant to the English king since they were founded. It also didn't help that the New England colonies had supported Parliament and Oliver Cromwell in the war against the king. King Charles decided that he would take legal action to nullify the charters of New England because he wanted to take direct control and govern these colonies more directly. Connecticut and Rhode Island voluntarily surrendered their charters, which in the end probably worked to their favor because after the Dominion disbanded, they were able to pick up where they left off with their charters intact. Massachusetts at Bay, however, decided to fight the nullification action in the courts, and the courts nullified their charter, which meant after the Dominion was over, the Massachusetts Bay colonists would have to get a new charter from the next king. The colonies of New Hampshire and Plymouth had no charter, so it was easy enough to take control of them. Not all of Charles' advisors agreed with this policy, however. One of them, Lord Halifax, advised that the same laws under which they live in England ought to be established in a country inhabited by Englishmen. He also added that he could never like to live under a king who should have it in his power to take at pleasure the money out of his pockets. Halifax was objecting to the fact that this new political structure that Charles was setting up in New England would have no elected legislatures, so the king would be able to tax them at his own will. It would be taxation without representation. In 1685, Charles died, and his brother, James, became the next king. James had converted to Catholicism, and in fact, he was the last Catholic king of England. It's kind of ironic that he was king, since at that time England had laws prohibiting Catholics from holding public office, and yet here's the highest officer in the land, he being king of England. James went farther than his brother Charles had gone. He wanted to consolidate the colonies, and he used as his model the Spanish system with its hierarchy of viceroys and governors, which was much more under control of the king in Spain. James took all of the New England colonies and combined them into one big colony, Today, this area would have included Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. Two years later, he added New York and New Jersey. He called this new colony the Dominion of New England, with the capital to be at Boston. James didn't want to have to run these colonies with the interference of these pesky elected representative assemblies, so he did away with them. It was bad enough, in his opinion, that he had to deal with Parliament. One of the reasons that James set up this super colony of the Dominion of New England was so that he could consolidate colonial resources and use them against the French in Canada. I also think that vengeance played a certain role in the reason James decided to set up and restructure the New England colonies in this way. To govern this new large colony, King James selected Sir Edmund Andros, a loyal follower who had been previously governor of New York and New Jersey. In a commission to Edmund Andros, the king wrote, James the second, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, to our trusty and well-beloved Sir Edmund Andros, Knight, greeting, whereas by our commission under the great seal of England, we have constituted and appointed you to be our Captain General and Governor-in-Chief in and over all that part of our territory and dominion of New England and America. 
No doubt the new governor was certainly flattered by the commission as well as the trust given to him, but really he had an impossible task. On the one hand, he was to carry out the king's orders and wishes, and on the other hand, he had to deal with an angry and already resentful New England population. If Edmund Andros had known that just in a few years distant he would be thrown in jail by these colonists, he might not have accepted the commission. It was a large territory to govern, and by modern standards was sparsely populated. Andros and his government exercised little control out of the population centers of Boston and New York. Beyond those areas, his authority probably didn't exist very much. One of the things that really irritated the colonists was the fact that they had no elected representative assembly to represent them. In the commission to Andros, the king stipulated, We do hereby give and grant unto you full power and authority, by and with the advice and consent of our said council, or the major part of them, to make, constitute, and ordain laws, statutes, and ordinances for the public peace, welfare, and good government of our said territory and dominion and of the people and inhabitants thereof. So there was no provision by the king for him to set up an assembly. He just simply ruled with his council. Andros didn't help himself either. Instead of trying to finesse policy and go between the two difficulties like other governors did, he carried out the king's will with a zeal that irritated some of the colonists. The Puritan population that Andros governed considered themselves as a godly elect who were establishing a biblical society that would be a light and an example to the rest of the world. They felt it was much better to defy the king than to disobey God. King James was Catholic, and this automatically connected him in the minds of these Puritans to the Pope, whom they despised. Drawing on the colorful imagery provided in Revelations chapter 17, Puritans described the Pope as the whore of Babylon and the great scarlet whore. Not only did they fear the imposition of Catholicism, but the Puritans of New England also feared that an arbitrary government would be imposed upon them, and that King James might rely on French Canadians, who were also Catholic, and their Indian allies to help him impose it in these endeavors. The few members of the Church of England, or Anglicans as they are called, viewed the situation much differently. They saw the dominion of New England and James' new program as rescuing them from what they considered arbitrary and oppressive government imposed on them by the Puritans. With no other political considerations in mind, it's easy to see how this setup that James had organized, this new colony, would run into problems almost from the very start. Late in 1688, news reports from England began arriving in the colonies that King James had fled and had abdicated the throne. Once these reports were verified, the colonists sprang into action. In Boston, Governor Edmund Andros was arrested and thrown in jail, although he later tried to escape disguised as a woman. A provincial council of safety formed and issued a declaration with quite heated words stating that the king's policies were a horrid popish plot a design and prospect with nothing less than the extinction of the Protestant religion. In New York, a militia officer named Jacob Leesler and some of his men seized the fort at the southern tip of Manhattan. Interestingly, there was also a revolt in Maryland, which had not been part of the Dominion. The proprietors or owners of Maryland, the Calvert family, today known as the Baltimores, were Catholic and deeply resented by the Protestant population there. John Cood, who led this rebellion, declared that he did not care a fart for William Calvert or a turd for the chancellor or governor. The other colonies, such as Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Carolina, were unaffected by these events, and they were never part of the Dominion, although I can't help but think that the colonists there sighed a sigh of relief, knowing that they would not have Catholicism imposed on them, and that their elected assemblies were safe for the time being. The French took advantage of all the disarray in the English colonies by leading raids against English settlements in the backcountry of Maine. Even though the Dominion only lasted a few years, it had some important lasting consequences, especially on Massachusetts Bay and on the Plymouth Colony. As you recall, Massachusetts Bay Colony fought the nullification of its charter in court and lost, so it had to have a new charter issued. The new king, William III, did issue a very generous charter to Massachusetts Bay Colony, but it had some important differences from their old one. Probably the most important difference was that the people would no longer elect their governor, but instead the governor would now be appointed by the king. The Plymouth Colony, the home of the Pilgrims and the first Thanksgiving, was merged into Massachusetts Bay Colony and they became one colony and disappeared from the map entirely. I can only imagine how different New England would look today if Plymouth Colony had survived separately, it would be a separate state all on its own. The failure of the Dominion ensured that the colonies would have their own representative assemblies, which was one of their biggest grudges against the Dominion. It's interesting to speculate about what would have happened had the Dominion of New England survived into the modern times. 
For example, think how different a modern map of the United States would be, especially with political representation in the Senate. The northeastern United States would no longer consist of several small states, but one big state, and that would have changed the makeup of the Senate completely. I don't think the Dominion, however, could have survived. I think the tide of opinion was against it. The idea of representative government was too deeply ingrained in Englishmen, whether they were in England or in the colonies, and I think eventually they would have forced maybe a future king after James to modify things so that they had an elected assembly. The failure of the Dominion clearly demonstrated, too, that the colonists in North America were irreversibly Protestant, just as the English were in England. It's interesting that many of the complaints that the colonists had against the Dominion of New England showed up 100 years or almost 100 years later in the Declaration of Independence. Had King George III paid more closer attention to history and the temperament of his colonists, perhaps he wouldn't have suffered the embarrassment of having them revolt against him. King James's abdication of the English throne has come to be known in history as the Glorious Revolution. In our next podcast, we'll take a careful look at those events because they had important and lasting consequences on the political and constitutional culture of the United States. For further information on the subject of the Dominion of New England, I recommend the following books and articles. The Glorious Revolution in America by David S. Lovejoy. English America and the Revolution of 1688, Royal Administration and the Structure of Provincial Government by J. M. Soson. The Glorious Revolution by John Miller. The Constitutional History of Modern Britain Since 1485 by Sir David Lindsay Kerr. New England in the Reign of Charles II. Published in the Illustrated Magazine of Art, Volume 4, Number 23, 1854. Equality and Empire, The New York Charter of Liberties, 1683, by David S. Lovejoy. And Law in Colonial New York, The Legal System of 1691. Published in the Harvard Law Review, Number 80, Number 8, June 1967.